Hey everybody, it's Chris, and today I am with Dr. Tom Moorcroft. And Dr. Tom is an osteopathic physician, and he specializes in Lyme disease, tick-borne co-infections, mold illness, as well as kids with infection-induced autoimmune encephalitis, PANS and PANDAS. And, uh, you know, these are topics that I have not really interviewed anyone on. And I'm really excited to get into this because Lyme disease is incredibly debilitating. And um, there's there's a lot of conflicting information online. And I know it's really difficult for folks with Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses. I had a good friend that had Rocky Mountain spotted fever to actually find solutions. So Dr. Tom, thanks for taking the time to do this. I'm, I'm really excited to learn from you. Yeah, well, Chris, thanks for the invite. I think it's going to be a great conversation. And like you said, I mean, it's sort of under-recognized and it, it is another one of these epidemics that's out there. And as long as we can get the information out to people, always happy to serve and help alleviate some suffering whenever we can. That's great. So how did you get into osteopathic medicine? You know, I, osteopathic medicine was kind of like follow your heart. I said, I, I, I knew that medical school was going to be a bit challenging. At least that's what people had told me. It'd be a little hard. And I said, well, I didn't know the difference between an MD or a DO, except for the fact that one guy I knew and I had done some work for teaching wilderness medicine was like an exceptional human being. And he was a different attitude than most doctors I knew. And so I said, I'll check out the school he goes to and a few others. And I basically was interviewing at different places that had a lot of outdoor activities, you know, because I figured I was going to be studying a lot. When I have a minute, I want to be able to go right outside and play because it's really a big part of my passion. And I, you know, I, I interviewed at a couple of places and I went into the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I just really, it was like lots of glass and it was open and everybody was like, just so nice. So I just, it felt like I was at home. And when it came down to say, should I become an MD or a DO? I said, let's see, the, the DO place feels like home. I'm going to get the same degree and more. And one of the best doctors I know on the planet's a DO. So it was done deal. <laughs> what would you describe the difference between the DO and the MD uh, for folks that don't know? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, back in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, a, a frontier physician by the name of Andrew Taylor still said, hey, we're giving people arsenic and strychnine and doing bloodletting and that stuff doesn't make any sense anymore. We know it doesn't work. So let's just stop doing that. And oh, by the way, like if you do some manipulation, people actually get better more quickly. So as the times were, everybody kind of like thought he was crazy <laughs> for introducing common sense in the medicine. And he just wanted to kind of change the dialogue and like no one was into it. So he had to create a new profession. And, in, you know, it was 1892, he had his first class with women, uh, all kinds of people, color blacks, Native Americans. He just included everybody in this healing modality. And really, it, it boils down to a philosophy. We're very clear on the philosophy that the body has the ability to heal itself. It has a tendency towards health. We have to look, you know, long before body, mind, spirit was sort of tra some trademark thing that everybody talked about, still was just saying, look, the body is, or the human being is really this unity of all of these aspects, and they're not separatable. We just kind of separate them, you know, by words, you know, but... Um, it, to talk about them, but really you're, you're a full unit. And if we don't look at your mental and spiritual aspects of who you are, we can't treat you fully as a human being. Um, and physically you won't get better. And then he had this philosophy about structure and function are interrelated. Right. And so we see this very commonly, like if you have like a surgical procedure where they do those laparosc uh, you know, laparoscopic procedures where they try to minimize how invasive it is. And we put some carbon dioxide into your belly and we blow it up. A lot of people won't poop after that. And so we call it ileus, you know, post-operative ileus. And it's, it, but it was that the, the stretch on the organs stopped you from pooping, right? The pressure and osteopaths found that if we were able to loosen up the back muscles, because they were all wound up as well, then it would loosen up the internal organs. So they have this relationship between how your body's supposed to function and, and the structure we see. And, you know, so it's just a really nice way. And unfortunately, my experience has been most osteopaths are MDs, right? And they don't use that osteopathic training as much. Um, but it's becoming more and more, people are seeking it more and more. They want a doctor who's well-rounded and looks at them, you know, as his full human being and also has the ability to use their hands, not just for treatment, but 
sometimes even more important for diagnosis. So it's a, it's a pretty cool profession if you really dive into to its roots and really live it. You know, I appreciate the fact that it's uh, it's a very holistic based approach to to medicine, health and healing, uh, looking at the whole the whole person, treating the whole person, investigating root causes of disease mm -hmm. and uh, helping that that person or patient identify and eliminate the root causes of disease in their life, you know, because, you know, if the root causes persist, I mean, the best that most uh, you know, conventionally trained doctors can do is just give you a pr pharmaceutical prescription to alleviate your symptoms, but you never actually get well. Get to the cause. It's interesting yeah. when, when you said that it reminds me of something is a lot of times, like if you go have any manual therapist like work on your neck, but you have to have your neck work done once a week, twice a week, or, you know, it just keeps coming out and coming out. There's probably because that's not the root cause, right? And and we can look at this all across medicine with different examples, but I think it's a simple one that just says that's a compensation. And one of the things that we learn in osteopathy is that your body is doing its very, very best to be healthy at any one given point. Now, it may not feel like, I'm sure back when you were going through everything, you're like, yeah, my body is definitely not doing the best, right? <laughs> but it really is. And the outward expression of symptoms is a guidepost, a signpost for where we need to go to heal. And that's what I just think is when, when you have a medical system that teaches you to look at compensations and other things to guide you more directly to the underlying root cause, then we can actually make some real changes. So how did you get into Lyme disease and uh, tick-borne illness, those kind of things? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had gotten Lyme disease acutely and I got treated relatively early on, but I got um, 10 days of treatment. And then for the next eight years, I had all these weird symptoms, everything from sort of like insomnia and brain fog, joint and muscle pain. And, you know, it, it this was a, I was a person where school was very, very simple for me. I just, as long as I showed up and half tried, I could get like really good grades. And I was just like, I was very fortunate that way. And then it was like, I couldn't do simple math in my head, um, you know? And so ultimately I went through, people are like, oh, you're depressed. You have bipolar. I'm like, well, not really. I'm just pissed off that like, I'm coming to you telling you my body's broken and there's a reason for it. Um, and you're telling me it's all in my head. I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't upset until my body hurt so bad, you know? And then ultimately I get this diagnosis of uh, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And I was like, well, that's really great. You just described the symptoms that I came into your office telling you I had for the last eight years. So um, ultimately someone gave me a yoga DVD and for some reason I started trying it I started getting better. And then my body's like, change your diet. So I changed my diet. And then afterwards I learned, I didn't know about any of this stuff because they don't teach it in medical school, at least not then. And so I just started pursuing that. And it was interesting. I got all better, thankfully, after I ran into a couple of really good osteopathic physicians and a naturopath, they helped me get finished the job after I did all that, you know, the work on my own. And then I was just wanted to do osteopathic manipulation in my practice. And I was just going to, my goal was to get paid to meditate basically all day long and live a stress-free medical practice. Somebody walked in one day and she's got all this pain. And I, I did an osteopathic treatment and I was like, nothing changed. I'm like, I know I'm early in my career, but I studied this a lot and like nothing changed. And like the sensation I got in my hands is like, this is infectious, right? Because my mentors are like, figure out what a heart attack feels like, figure out what a stroke feels like, figure out what a pneumonia feels like and cancer feels like, and start to notice they have different energetic signatures essentially. And I knew this girl had an infection. I didn't know who to refer to. So I started treating her. She, one of her friends came in after they chit chatted, I treated her. And next thing you know, I have this like runaway practice treating tick-borne infection just because I listened to one person. So what are, what are the things that people need to know right off the bat? Let's say you get a tick bite. Yeah. I mean, what do you do? Well, Lyme disease is the number one vector borne illness in, in the United States, you know, and so it's ahead of all these other insect transmitted diseases. Um, it's transmitted by the bite of ixoides ticks. So on the East coast, it's the black legged tick. We have the Western black legged tick or most people know as deer ticks. And they're the most commonly infected ticks. You know, they have a much higher, uh, like you were saying, you're uh, uh, someone, you know, had Rocky mountain spotted fever. It's like, 
the the um, those ticks, you know, the dog tick, they can transmit that, but their infection rate is low. So whenever you get bitten by any tick, it's pro, you know it's good to know what the tick is and where you are, so you know what infections are in them. But especially with the deer tick in the Midwest and the you know the Northeast, and it's starting to spread, you know, Lyme disease. You, you just got to know that any bite is a high, potentially high risk bite. There's debate over whether we should do preventive or prophylactic treatment or not. I'm certainly in the camp where if you're going to give somebody, you know, five years of an antibiotic for acne, I certainly can offer you three weeks of prophylactic treatment so you can kill Lyme right away and not get chronically infected. Um, so I think with tick bites, we need to remove them properly, um, and which basically involves grabbing them as close to the skin as possible, lifting and holding. There's a million other ways people describe to remove it. And that's the only right way, <laughs> you know, really not. The what about the little tool that you twist? Yeah, the twisting. The issue is the 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 Lyme bacteria that's in your gut is in the mid gut of the, of the tick. And it and the, one of the reasons that a lot of people say it has to be on for 38 to, or 36 to 48 hours before it transmits, which is completely false. But the risk of transmission goes way up after about a day and a half. But it's because the, the spirochete needs to swim up into you from the mid gut of the tick. So if I do all these spinnings or essential oils, or I do anything that irritates the tick, it, its mouth parts are actually barbed. So when it's in you, it can't get out really quickly. And the only way if you irritate the tick it, to get it to release is it has to like use jet propulsion, which is essentially vomiting into you. So now you took a moderate risk tick bite and made it very high risk of infection. Because in order to get out of you, because you're irritating it, it had to eject its stomach contents, which includes Lyme. So we just try to minimize the risk, you know? All right. Um, so what's the technique again? It's literally, you just get needlepoint tweezers if you have yep. those or, or, and some of them have V's, you know, there are the ones with the V's that's fine. Get under the, as close to the mouth parts and the skin as possible, tweeze, lift and hold. If it's been in for a little bit, it might be 10 or 15 seconds. If it's been in for a long time, I mean, it could be a minute or two before it lets loose. So, yeah, so you're going to see your skin. I mean, you're, you know, it's like, you're going to be, yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. You're, 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 you're going to yeah. be holding on to your skin, but you should just keep the pressure and wait right. for it to let go. Yeah. Like you don't want to yank it out. Everybody's worried about the mouth parts. The best way to do is to just lift and wait. Tried and Got true. It. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. Now, what <laughs> about, uh, so my wife is, uh, she's, I guess I, she's, um, I'm going to say this in a nice way, but she's pretty paranoid about ticks and tick-borne illness. She's never had one, but anytime our dog has had a tick or I've had a tick on me, she will send it off to a lab. So she'll mm -hmm. save the tick and send it off to a lab called Ticknology, which is about 50 bucks. And they'll, they'll test yeah. it and tell you if it has, uh, you know, Any infections. Is that a good resource or is there a better one? Yeah. I mean, I think the good news is when you send a part of a tick over to one of these labs, like I use tickreport.com, but, and they have the whole tick and they're looking at DNA and genetics of the organism. So it's going to be pretty darn accurate. Um, it's a really good idea to do now where I live. Um, unless that thing just bit you, we're generally doing prophylactic treatment as well, which could be done with medicines or could be do it done with herbs. If you work with somebody who's trained in that, but at the very least, mark it down on your calendar, know what day it was, and definitely get it tested. Because if it doesn't have an infection in it, you can't get an infection, right? And But if it does have infections in it, at least you know what you're looking for. Um, and generally, I do, pro, like I said, prophylactic treatment, because in Connecticut, at least, depending upon the, in, the year, we can get as low as 30 or 40% of the ticks have Lyme, and other years, 70, upwards of 90% of them are infected with Lyme. So it's like, you know, it depends on where you risk. live too, right? Yeah. And I know there's been uh, sort of been like denial. It's almost like CDC denial that there's no ticks in the South. <laughs> you know, there's sort of a weird thing that's gone on for years where they just, you know, they won't acknowledge that Lyme carrying ticks are in the South, but they right. definitely are. And I, we've met a number of people who've gotten Lyme from tick bites in Tennessee, for example. For sure. Um, and, uh, I, I, do you have any opinion on that? Why they're why they're so cagey and weird about Lyme disease? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, opinions you is, want to share. 
Absolutely. Open book here. You know, I mean, I think that that's the, I, I always say like, you know, when I look at, I sent in a, um, a manuscript, uh, a case report to a, one of the top four medical journals in the world. And I got this nice letter back that said, Hey, you know what? This, this information is um, very strong, but our readers don't need to know about it. I'm like, I sent you in a case where we confirmed that a, a young man had gotten bitten by a deer tick and got Lyme disease in less than 24 hours. I kind of think that's important information. There's a lot of censorship there and there's, there's lots of reasons people think why. And I mean, I think there's, there's competing interests, right? One is we don't want to scare the hell out of the public because that's what COVID's for. And you know, yeah, apparently they're not uh, worried about that anymore. <laughs> right. Right. But it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, man, because what we know is as habitats change, as global climate change continues, we're seeing songbird. Like I have a friend in, in, in Oklahoma who was like, look, I had this guy came in with the erythema migrans, bullseye rash, Lyme disease, right? I diagnosed him with it, started treating and the state said, no, when I, he reported, there's no ticks in, in, in Utah or Utah. Yeah. Uh, Oklahoma that have this Lyme. And he's like, well, I have the tick right here. And we, you know, so they sent it to them and it had Lyme in it. Right. And the guy had blood test positive, like everything was positive. And they go, oh, it must have fallen off a songbird. Well, how does that mean it's not in Oklahoma, right? It's, you know, and so we do see that there are areas where we don't have a lot of ticks that carry Lyme, but other ticks are hitching a ride and getting dropped off. And so that's a little harder to track scientifically, I think. And then there also, there's this whole thing with Lyme where people are just trying to, what's real research and clinical work are completely different, right? Like our, just our, our blood test for Lyme, most clinicians are taught to use research criteria to confirm their clinical suspicion, which is not what it's for. It's for epidemiology and research across the country and how we make public policy. And so, you know, and then there's this, that's kind of like me trying to skirt around the, like the real issue. And so some of it's science and trying to differentiate between research and clinical practice. And that, that is a problem. We're seeing that with COVID, like, people in the public are just not used to hearing the conversation that doctors are used to having in the background. And we talk about it for years and years and years before, and, and we act on it, but we don't bring it out to the public till we have more knowledge. But the other part is they, for a while, were allowing people to patent parts of the spirochete. So proteins on the, the bacterium that gives you Lyme, you could patent parts of it. And we see in our testing that certain people got together and said, only you can, you can only use these antigens that we happen to own. And that's now been rectified theoretically, but it's, there's a lot of stuff. And, and I think a lot of people are publishing on Lyme disease and that's how they keep their jobs. And if people in the clinical practice who don't have to publish it's it's just it. There's too many conflicting things. There's too much money in it. Actually, I mean, I think is what it boils down to, and ego. And I don't really care. Like I'm here. I need to help people. We're 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 missing diagnoses. We have kids going into the ER for psychiatric breakdowns, but it's really just an an, an infection induced, you know, triggering of this behavioral disorders. We have adults losing their jobs and their families. And so I just like, we have to get past it, you know, and whether or not I know all the answers to how to fix that part of the system. I mean, the, the bottom line is we're finding these ticks all over the place and people are getting sick. And we now have research coming out of major institutions like Johns Hopkins and Tulane showing that a short course of antibiotics doesn't do anything, including 0% cure rates in experimental animals. So to tell me 10 or 14 or 21 days of an antibiotic and you're one and done on this, that might work, but a lot of people are, are suffering. And in fact, at the end of 2020, there's a study came out of Brown that there were gonna be estimated 1.9 million people with post-treatment Lyme syndrome slash chronic Lyme disease. That's just like obscene. It's a lot of people. And uh, so I have a bunch of questions now. One is, let's start with the bullseye rash. Is that always a telltale sign uh, or is it uh, not? Yeah, the rash, um, the rash is uh, by the CDC, they report that it's present in about 70% of people. When you look in the research, uh, if you go to PubMed and you search through all these things, it, it falls somewhere in the 40 to 60% range. So call it 50% of people have an erythema migraines rash. 
And those of us, when you start to look deeper in the data, it's probably more like 15 or 20% of people. So it's absent commonly. But one of the, the issues, Chris, becomes people miss what an erythema migrans rash is. And that's the name, that's a medical name, erythema chronica migrans for this rash that we get with Lyme. Most people assume it's a bullseye and a bullseye is a type of erythema migrans rash. And it's about 20 to 30% of all true erythema migrans rashes. Most of the ones we see are like purplish red blotches or there might be like this red thing and it eventually has some central clearing, but they don't look normal. and a lot of people think it has to be at the bite site. It does not. It may be. You can have more than one of them. And so it's just one of these situations where doctors and other healthcare practitioners have to be aware that a, that a kind of a smudge could is actually the most typical erythema migraines rash. And it's good for patients and the public to be aware because a lot of times you'll go, and oh, it's like, oh, it's not a bullseye, so I'm not going to go to the doctor. Well, if you have this weird pockmark on your arm or your leg, you might want to get it checked out because it could be an erythema migraines rash. Okay. So uh, you should definitely mail off the tick and, and possibly go to the doctor. Now, what, what's the best diagnostic testing? Because I've definitely heard that there is debate on certain type of Lyme tests. Mm -hmm. You know, some are more accurate than others. And what is your opinion? Yeah, I mean, there, there was a really interesting, what they call meta-analysis, where they kind of pull, they, they take a look at all the papers out there and pick out the really high quality ones and say, if we pull all this data, what is a great recommendation that can come out of it? You know, can we glean any evidence that those studies alone couldn't do? And they found that the typical two-tiered CDC recommended testing, which is um, an, 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 a screening test, an antibody screen, followed by this Western blot test, is about 56% sensitive, but it's 99% to 100% specific. And in English, that means if you do that two-tier test and they say it's positive, it's pretty much a done deal, 100% you're positive. But if it says you're negative, we actually can have, we can miss 44% of people who are truly positive. So 88 out of every 200 true positive people are missed with that testing strategy. Hmm. So it's essentially a flip of a coin, so basically it's if it's it has a very low risk of false positive. So if it, it comes back if it comes back positive, you're positive. You can be pretty certain you're positive. But if it comes back negative, high you, risk is still might be positive. Right. Okay. So, th so there's so a couple of ways to sort through that, right? I mean, yeah. one of them is the erythema migrans rash in an endemic area, which is most of the country, I mean, or people travel to the northeast, upper Midwest. Those things, that's positive, right? You don't have to, it's kind of like, you know, go to jail, don't pass, go, the whole monopoly. They just like, you're, you you don't need a test because if you do a test acutely when you have a rash, the likelihood of a false negative goes through the ceiling. So rash in the right locality is 100% diagnostic. Now, the next thing is it migratory- Plus confirming the tick too, right? Would uh, Absolutely. More. But there's no, there's no better testing strategy. No, not really. I mean, the, the, it's Lyme is a clinical diagnosis supported by laboratory data, not the other way around, because there's no test that hundred percent says no. And there's very few tests that hundred percent say yes. Like if we do the double testing, it's pretty dang close. If you happen to get DNA of Lyme or baby, it's like you're clear, but the problem is the negative test doesn't help. Um, and so what we look at is we say, what are there common symptoms that will really help us, right? Um, certainly, if you have a history of tick bite, obviously that helps, especially if it's a deer tick, because that's the only one you're getting Lyme from. Then joint pain and muscle pain, you know, summer flu type symptoms are really commonly described in Lyme. But migrating joint pain and migrating numbness and tingling are ones that are much more specific to Lyme disease than say just pain. And how and, quickly would someone experience these symptoms after a bite? Uh, anywhere from a week to about four weeks. And some people okay. it's months. So you can actually have people get bit in August, September, and they don't have symptoms till February. Got it. But so there's the, no telltale immediate. I mean, obviously the rash is one, but correct. beyond that, it might not be. Yeah. Well, and going back to, for a while, going back to kind of play, just to balance out sort of what I was trying to say earlier was why are people 
arguing about this. Well, part of the problem is we know that anywhere in medicine where there's not a clear cut diagnostic test and a clear cut treatment, there's a lot of experts who are doing their best and, and they're just butting heads often because we don't know the right thing. And the fact that like you could get bitten in August or September when you're on a trip to the Cape and then you can be back in Kansas or whatever in February and get Lyme disease, you know, it, it's a pro it's problematic, you know, because we don't we don't have really definitive stuff. So people are working on that. But I think that that's also what separates a lot of us is we're all trying to do the best we can with a few people with ulterior motives. And it's just we don't the, the research just isn't hasn't caught up yet, you know. So my brother in law, he's been bit by ticks so many times the guy always has a tick on him <laughs> like right, right. We just laugh about it like he's always got ticks on him and uh you know and as far as we can tell he can tell he, he doesn't have any symptoms of lyme right he's never right none of the symptoms right he's never had any of that now he's had some rashes and some you know stuff on his skin from the tick bites but is it possible that uh some people have you know lyme immunity that they maybe they get bit as a child and develop an immunity and subsequent bites just are not an issue. Yeah. Um, my experience has been in Lyme disease proper, like Borrelia burgdorferi infection from a deer tick, that does not occur. But we do see that some people have, are more resilient to illness or they have very mild illness. Like not everybody's sick and gets chronic. You know, I mean, the evidence, everybody says quotes is saying that 80% of people with Lyme disease get better with three weeks of antibiotics. Like, that's great, but there's another 20% of people out there and with about a half a million people getting new Lyme every year, you know, missing 100,000 people and, and them potentially not getting better, that, that's, that's where you get the numbers to go. So I'm not, I'm a very, I'm a student of science, right? And when the science has holes in it, I'll be happy to point it out, but most people, 80% of people are gonna, as long as they get treated, are gonna do great. The question is, what about these other people that sort of the CDC and everybody else is, is a little more quiet on? And what's interesting, those Rocky Mountain spotted fever, there's some work that suggests that if you get that once, you may develop lifelong immunity. So different ticks transmit different infections and different infections, there'd be a different answer to your question. So the other part is too, a lot of people are getting bitten by dog ticks or Lone Star ticks, um, and they have other infections that they could give you but the rate of infection within the ticks in general is much lower than in say the deer tick, which is transmitting all the big ones that you hear about. Um, so it, it kind of depends on your location in the country. And certainly if you're on the West coast and get bitten by, you know, an exoides tick versus on the East coast, the infection rates as we speak are much, much higher on the East coast. They're growing on the West coast, but they're, it, it totally location is really important to understand for that. My other buddy who got Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, he was in Montana. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm a little fuzzy on, on the details, but I'm pretty sure he, he was pretty sick for over a year. I mean, really bad shape, like what couldn't go to work and stuff like really, really struggled. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and as far as I know, I think he's doing fine now. Like, I guess he's completely recovered. We need to catch up. Um, on that, because we haven't talked about it in a while, but uh, is that common? I mean, how does how does that illness typically play out? Yeah, I mean, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is a little bit more of an acute issue, and it can be fatal. But you know, you, you get it, like it sounds like fever, and often you know, days in you get a rash. And then there's like ten percent of people with Rocky Mountain spotted fever do not get a rash those people have a high likelihood of mortality because you missed the diagnosis because you just think, because it, it looks like you have the flu and it's very much like anaplasma, which can come from a, a deer tick, ehrlichia, which some ehrlichias are in deer ticks. A lot of them are in lone star ticks, same general family of infections. So you're going to get a fatigue, you're going to get um, a fever and it can be quite high, you know, 104, 105. I mean, it can be pretty significant. And then you get all this sort of like, flu and the problem with rocky mountain spotted fever is you can develop a cough and they can actually you can actually have changes in your lung on x-rays that might confuse somebody make you think you have a pneumonia 
And for that particular bug, there's only doxycycline that we know of as a sure bet to work. So if they pick, pick out a different uh, drug that you would be more commonly used for pneumonia, you can miss it. So yeah, you know, typically that's more of an acute thing. Um, you can have some really horrible sort of like short-term stuff, mid-term stuff, if you actually miss it, you know, and it gets later. Um, but people do generally recover. Now, if you have a, a harder clinical or acute course, you know, six months or a year to finally fully recover is not uncommon. Now, if you flip over to Lyme disease, that story is way more common. And it's often because we have evidence that there are persister forms, meaning there's an actively growing form that causes like the main symptoms of Lyme, but the ones that keep it going and cause chronic infection, there's many, many defenses that Lyme has to be able to survive within us when our immune system goes after it, when our medications or herbs are used to go after it. So, and, and that uh, as somebody who practices this for a long time, it's really great because more recently, last two years or so, a lot more research into how to get to those so that we don't have to be having these one year, three year, six year conversations, you know, maybe it's six months or 18 months, but people are better and back out. So we're, we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> that is encouraging. So what about prevention? Are there particular, um, you know, bug repellents? <laughs> like we used one called repel, which is pretty highly rated, but I don't know what your opinion on those bug repellents and also, you know, supplementation. So are there are there some uh, immune supportive supplements and herbs and things that you recommend for people that don't have Lyme yet, but they're just like, hey, I'm going to be in the woods. I'm going to be out. I'm out. I'm outdoors a lot. Like, are there, you know, stuff that they sh that should maybe be in in a heavy circulation in their bloodstream? <laughs> right. Um, you know, I think from a prevention perspective is is Lyme is considered paradomestic, meaning approximately 75% of people get it, get it in their yard or in their neighbor's yard. And the reason for that is um, ticks are edge species, right? So think, we call them a deer tick, but really deer may actually not be the problem. It's more the habitat that deer like to be in is where other uh, chipmunks and um, rodents like mice are, and they seem to be the primary vector. And so what ends up happening is 10 feet into the woods and 10 feet onto your lawn is the primary area where the deer tick is going to be living. And if they get further out from that, there's, you know, they, they like it to be warm. They like it to be damp. They don't like super bright sunlight where they're going to get, you know, all dried up and everything. And if you think about your yard, most people take the swing set and they put it in the corner in the shade, which is prime tick habitat. Then you go and you go, oh, people make gardens and it's like all around our house. We have these nice, you know, beautiful ornamental things. Those are all beautiful places for ticks to be. So, we're, we, you know, it's like high risk areas. So when we go outside, one of the most important things are you can put permethrin on your clothing and permethrin is toxic, especially to aquatics um, and aquatic wildlife and plant life. So just don't pour any of it into the stream next to your house when you want to get rid of it, you know. It's wet. We try not to touch it. Um, spray it on your clothes. Let it let it dry. Once it's dry, um, it's it'll kill ticks on contact, and it's good for mosquitoes and other things. But it's non toxic to us. And if we spray it at home, uh, you'll get six to eight washes out of it. If you send it off to a company like Insect Shield, they'll actually uh, professionally impregnate your clothes essentially, and it'll last like 60, 70 washes. What's really cool is that once it's dry, there's no smell, there's no toxicity. Um, and they've done studies where even if you only put on your shoes and socks, you can decrease the number of ticks on you by something like 70% just by spraying your shoes and socks. Wow. So if, you'd, if, if, if you're like me and you're like, I don't, well, I don't want to get Lyme, but I also don't want to spray my clothing with all this stuff, at least on your shoes and socks. And, and just so all the listeners know, I mean, Permethrin is actually used in scabies treatment. So we'll have people put it on at like a hundred times the dose you would put on your clothes directly on your head and leave it there and on your skin. So it's not like we don't use it on humans, but I certainly don't want to be messing with it too much, you know, um, just in case. And then I do use, I use cedar, uh, cedar side, um, 
you know, they have um, a tick repellent, like any, some of these natural herbals are really good to spray on other things. And I spray my, my dog gets top spot too, but I spray on his paws and his legs and his underside, some of these herbal repellents, you know, just, you get the ones that are safe and, you know, c- cedar oil, cedar oil with lemongrass or tend to be my main go-tos and just get the, a good concentration. And then um, the other thing is, you know, come in, take your clothes off. If you put them in the dryer right away, depending upon how he- fast your dryer heats up, you can kill ticks off right away. So you don't want to put them through the wash because they're not going to die. But if you just throw them right in, if it's electric dryer, it's usually five to 50, uh, 10 minutes. If it's a gas or a propane, it might be longer, like 20 to 30 minutes. You just got to get it up and make it super dry and then they die. And then I just recommend people take a shower as soon as they come home. I mean, I've washed more ticks off me, you know, before they had a chance. So typically if I, if you look at um, the nymph deer tick, which is the the size of a poppy seed, Mm -hmm. literally a poppy seed, transmits about 95% of Lyme because it's a no see and people miss it. The Mm. adult female will bite us. That's about 5% of the transmission. Um, you know, the, the female feeds for five to seven days, but the nymph typically four days. And going back for a second to the transmission is the first day it's less, it's like five to 10% transmission or maybe less, not impossible, but it it's very low. The thing is the tick can go from your big toe to the top of your head in 60 seconds if it wants to, but it, you, it'll walk around and it'll look for these warm, wet places to hide. And it usually doesn't bite right away. So if you have that, even if you've been out hiking all day, come in and take that shower and rinse it off. The other thing when you're outside, like in the summer, I don't really like to wear like all this like big garb and stuff. I do my shoes if I'm and my socks, if I happen to be wearing shoes and socks as opposed to flip-flops or something. But I like to wear compression shorts. And if you're really gonna be in an area that's high risk, a compression shirt. You don't have to get the super kind, like super athletic recovery, but kind of more the Under Armour style of like fashionable. Because if you think about it, the ticks are going to like your groin. They're going to like your armpit, your ears, and your hair. Now they'll bite you other places, but they're high yield places. So if I seal off and make an occlusive layer around my groin and around my armpits, I only have to check. I mean, I'm going to look at my legs and everything else, but it's, it, I'm not going to have a high risk of it in those areas. And then I can focus my tick check more in the ears and in my hair. So those are some ways that you can do it. And then, you know, for me, it's just like, whenever anybody asks me, should I be taking stuff to prevent tick stuff? I have a few people who get bit a ton. They're outside, no matter what they do, they're just, they're getting bit all the time. And and there's some herbs that they can use, but they're just, I mean, they're getting bit three or four times a week and they get Lyme disease three times a year. I'm like, I can't just let you wait, you know? But for the most people, I'm like, look, let's step back and think about how we keep ourselves healthy. You know, I recommend a plant-based whole food diet with whatever protein you like at the end. You know, you need, we really need nutrition and we should focus going back to the osteopathic part. Our body wants to be healthy. So we can be very resilient if we eat well, we stay hydrated. I love our vitamin D levels to be in the 50 to 60 range. And people argue a little higher, a little lower, but it's a general ballpark. Measure the blood levels because this helps you stay resilient. And then if you think about things that keep inflammation down and immune system function up, well, nitric oxide does, melatonin does, vitamin C does. We know this from a lot of COVID research, but we've also known this forever. So a couple of things I recommend people do is get up, get outside in the morning, get some fresh air, calm down, get some sunlight. Um, and then that'll also help you get to sleep and focus on taking the electronics and the blue light out late at night, do some sort of practice to slow yourself down. And I love breath awareness, Chris, because I've seen studies where breath awareness for 10 minutes a day turns off breast cancer genes. I recently saw if you meditate for an average of 45 minutes to an hour a day, which is a little bit more than a lot of people want to do. There's some, um, new research that's unpublished yet, but it's on its way out where you can actually prevent the the SARS-CoV-2 virus from getting into your cell. Your body's doing it, right? And so the other part with the nitric oxide, you could eat more beets, but you also have this ability, if you slow your breathing down, the more you slow your breathing down, you know, four or five times a minute, which is very easy if you focus on it. It sounds crazy, but it's it's super, I mean, I've gone minutes without even remembering to breathe when I'm in a meditative state. Your nitric oxide levels go up. And this is great because it dilates your blood vessels. It allows you to flush and detoxify better. And it's a 
very potent antioxidant, um, a very potent anti-inflammatory. So it's like all these natural things that we can do. So in other words, you know, eat right, go to sleep, drink some water, chill out. <laughs> and, and, and then also go outside and know, have this mindset that you're going to go have a good time. Because everybody I know goes in the woods afraid of Lyme gets Lyme. And everybody who just goes out in the real world <laughs> has a good time and they occasionally get Lyme, but it's not a big deal. I love it. Yeah. And, and uh, for those that don't understand, breath awareness is, is a just a simple exercise of sitting quietly and paying attention to your breathing and then controlling your breathing and, and deliberately slowing down your breathing and taking long draw, you know, long inhales, long exhales, just, you know, it's, and when you do that, you're actually uh, reducing inflammation, you're calming your nervous system, you're improving immune function, all these incredible things happen in the body physiologically, when you make that, uh, when you take just a few minutes, say five, 10 minutes or more to what some people call meditate, right? And you don't have to think on anything, you don't have to chant anything, right? It's just, if you're just you know, focusing on your breath, listening to the listening and feeling the air come in your body, right? Mm -hmm. And then listening and feeling it leave. Right? That's all you're doing. Uh, yeah, thank you for for bringing that up. I love it. Yeah. And, so, and if, if, if Chris, if I can tack one thing onto it, yeah, one, the next step is and there's so much research on this, including like improving immune function within as little as a week with like 15, 20 minutes a day, right? Once you kind of get used to just paying attention to whatever that is of your breath that draws your attention in and out of your nose, your throat, you know, your chest rise and fall. If you, if you start to think of the breathing or the breath of really just going into your chest and then feeling it, fill your heart, and then think of some gratitude, anything I'm, ha I'm, I'm thankful I'm alive. I'm thankful for my partner, my children, my dog, my gold fit, like, that I'm going to go on vacation in six months, whatever it is that really lights you up breathe into that and feel that gratitude. And when you do that, then you supercharge your immune system. And, you know, it's, it, it's not religious. It's not spiritual. It's you taking control of your own personal physiology and taking back control of your ability to heal yourself and just supercharging it. And it's like you said, Chris, so simple. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. And I, I, thank you. I wanted to, to try to remove the stigma that pe some people think it you're engaging in some kind of voodoo or witchcraft or spiritual practice which yes you can m make it a spiritual practice but uh but really it's just a physical therapy much yes. in the same way that going to the gym and lifting weights is a physical therapy right this is a this is what it is and it's right. absolute and the simplest um you know form so that's the way i look at it and uh, and the gratitude bit is so wonderful. It sounds a little bit like heart math. It, it pretty much is why our heart math comes from. And what's interesting yeah. to me is we talk a lot about the gut brain connection, right? Everybody's heard this. You search it. Well, the thing we have to remember is there's a gut brain heart connection. And then we look in the polyvagal theory. Steve Porges did this wonderful job telling us the difference between the, the how the autonomic nervous system works with fight or flight is our typical sympathetic and the joy, rejuvenation, hang out with your friends, relax, rejuvenate, go to sleep is your parasympathetic. But the thing here is there's in fight or flight, it, there's this conception of I can. I, if the saber tooth tiger is running after me, I can turn around and punch him in the face and win. Or I can run fast enough that I can get away. But what if you're chronically sick, you have an illness that or your finances are such that you don't feel like you have the ability, you're hopeless, you're stuck, you become frozen and you have this thing in your mind, I can't. So it's like the, if you ever saw like a chipmunk get grabbed by a cat outside, mm -hmm. it's running away, it's running away, it can get away, but then it gets caught. Then you hold it and it plays dead, it gets frozen, right? And then the second the cat lets go, because it's now bored, the thing runs away. It was, that's a great, that's a great old school survival mechanism. The problem for human beings is, we are safe almost all the time, even when we think we're not. And when we get into that chronically, because the, the chipmunk's not in it chronically, he's in it acutely, and then he goes right back to living life. But we get in it chronically, and there's profound, profound immune suppression. So I, and, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's obscenely profound. It's so much. And so the reason I bring the gratitude is this is a very simple, easy way without doing any special programs that you reboot and you go back to that, what, 
we talk about the ventral vagus nerve or the connection between the brain and the heart is made strong and balanced with the connection to the gut. So this is not voodoo. This is, this is all science-based. Like you said, Chris, you can make it spiritual. You can make it religious. You can augment those practices, but this is a medical therapy. There is so much science on it. And if you want, having an optimally functioning immune system and optimal, you know, stress and infection resilience, simple as five, 10 minutes of breathing every night. And then it helps you go to bed better. So you get better brain detox when you sleep better. So anyway, I'll go. <laughs> I love great. this topic. No, I talk I, about it all day long. <laughs> I absolutely love it. You're preaching to the choir for sure. And uh, yeah. it's extremely valuable. And it's, again, this is one of those things that costs you nothing. This is a very powerful free therapy for your immune system and your central nervous system to reduce inflammation in your body. Uh, you know, so many cascading benefits from a simple, you know, 10 minutes of quiet mm -hmm. meditative breathing per day. And it's good for your brain too. I mean, it's just on and on, but, uh, but again, it costs you nothing. You just have to make time to do it. And it's just a way that you take care of yourself one of the many ways you can take care of yourself and, and be empowered, right? And not just be a victim of disease, uh, hoping somebody's going to give you a pill to fix you, which is a perfect time to transition into, uh, <laughs> into treatments for Lyme. Uh, so let's talk about the pills <laughs> that, uh, that, right, right. that you found to be most helpful. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that, um, we know that in experimental animals that, that are infected for four to six months, if we treat them for the standard course of therapy, even a little longer for 28 days, zero are cured. Their blood tests may become negative, but when these animals are uh, unfortunately sacrificed and they study their tissue, they find that 100% of them are still infected. And if we do an IV for a month, followed by two months of oral medicines, we find that 27% are cured, meaning the other you know, set or not, you know, you've got 63% or are still infected and, and, you know, or 73%, I guess, if I could do my math on time here. Um, but, you know, what we found is we have antibiotics. I mean, most people, their, their initial sort of foray in the Lyme and the co-infections is antibiotics because that's kind of the common thing most doctors are prescribing. And we found that there's antibiotics that work through the cell wall of the organisms and some work inside of cells. And so a lot of times we need a combination of multiple antibiotics to effectively address that. And if you have a co-infection, a lot of times we need multiple antibiotics to prevent resistance or even to just even barely get the job done. And then we also have like, if you think about, we call it, talk about logarithmic growth, which is exponential growth, or you just call them growing forms, right? And then we also have persister forms. Um, and if you read any of the papers, some of them call it non-growing, some of them call it stationary or persister. And unfortunately in medicine, we like to use those terms interchangeably in the same paper. So if, <laughs> it gets a little confusing, but we have growing and non-growing forms. And the non-growing are kind of like suspended animation, partially hibernating, ready to keep the, everything going once the body kills everything else. Um, and so what we found is that we can we have some certain medications that are effective against these persister non-growing forms, but a lot of times we have none, right? And so there's been a lot of research in the last two years or so finding out what herbs or, or what can work. And we found some essential oils and primarily herbs that are very effective. So if we look at the work that's been done at Johns Hopkins for Lyme growing and non-growing, Bartonella growing and non-growing, uh, two of the main infections we get from these ticks. Um, we're seeing that cryptolepis, Chinese skull cap, and Japanese knotweed, along with a few other herbs, are really potent. And then if you look at Babesia duncani and Babesia, we have multiple species you can get from a deer tick, primarily two, but the duncani species, cryptolepis and Chinese skull cap are really good for. So this has been really great because these are herbs that have been around forever. But now we have we have a better understanding of exactly how to use them. And a lot of them we weren't using for these infections. Um, and so there's been a lot of research to try to sort through that. Um, Let me so, just interject because that's yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, that's that's what uh, that's the kind of research that needs to happen, right? This, which is in some ways rare. It's rare to to get funding. It's difficult to get funding to research a natural compound right. for a disease because there is no 
uh, there is no profit uh, on the back end of that research, right? If it's a right. pharmaceutical compound that can be patented, then all of a sudden, oh, we could make millions or billions off of this drug. <laughs> yeah. And so sure, we'll fund, fund that research, right? But so it's, I get, I always get so excited when I hear about nutritional science, you know, new nutritional science research or emerging research on natural compounds, uh, compounds from nature, because um, to me, that's some of the most unbiased science being done. It's being done by, by genuinely curious, passionate Correct. researchers who are trying to solve problems for humanity. And uh, that's great. I love it. You know, and it, what's really great too is a lot of the funding for this is primary. I mean, people have their labs, on it, but a lot of it's coming from donations from the public and from celebrities. And as more and more celebrities come out, you know, you know, Yolanda Foster, Justin Bieber, like on and on and on, you know, there's a lot of, we know that this is, is touching everyone. It's not just a few people in Connecticut or the Northeast. It's not just poor people. It's not just rich people. It's everyone is being affected by this. And so we're really seeing that. And, you know, so when we bring these treatments out, the beauty is we're getting, we, we learn, we're learning about different medications and how they work. We're learning different herbs. We're learning about different combinations, both clinically and also from these this bench research this scientific research at a lab and then we're combining it and what's been exciting for me i've been doing this you know a full time for the last 12 plus years pretty much my entire you know private practice career is we are now getting better at getting things done quicker and it's not always as fast as we would like because there's a lot more going on than just lime these days but man i'm telling you it's like this new research has just really revolutionized things. And then some of my mentors even like they're, they're doing that. No one else, like no one is funding any of the research. So they just do it in their office. And then they just partner up with people who are driven like they are to make a difference in the world. And they just do all the work. And it's like, you know, they get a little bit of private funding in the site here, but it's not enough to pay for it, but they just do it because this is the right thing to do. And it's just, it's a great time to work both work in this field. And if you happen to be getting Lyme or some of the co-infections now, the best time in human history to happen to accidentally get infected by it because our treatments are getting better and better. Well, I say a similar thing. There's never been a better time to get cancer, <laughs> you know. I highly recommend not getting it, but if you do, I would agree with that too. <laughs> now's the best time, you know, because uh, we've learned so much, right? And survival has never been higher. So well, that is, that's very encouraging. Uh, let's talk about antibiotics really quick, because I'm sure some of my listeners uh, would, would bristle, right, at antibiotics, because in the natural health community, there's, you know, there's sort of a general uh, distrust of anything pharmaceutical and, uh, and, and uh, an aversion to anything pharmaceutical, which I certainly have. Um, but uh, I am not anti-drug. Uh, there mm -hmm. are certain situations where a drug will save your life, and it usually has to do with an infectious situation, right? Right. In my opinion, the best drugs are the ones that can keep you from dying from an infection. Right. So life-threatening bacterial infections can, can be solved with antibiotics. Right. Now, the problem with antibiotics is that they're overprescribed to people who who, who them. receive no benefit, right? <laughs> exactly. They go to the doctor, they've got a flu virus or a you know influenza like illness from a virus and they get they just want to go home with something. And so doctors are writing antibiotic prescriptions so children and, right. and adults are uh, are taking these things for no reason and then harming their gut and whatever. So uh you know I'd love for you to speak on that because obviously you're you wouldn't with your training and background, you wouldn't be prescribing antibiotics for Lyme if you didn't see a benefit. Right. You know, I think acutely antibiotics are really important. I mean, because they work. The The question is, are you getting it or if you're catching it early? And in my practice, I mean, almost everybody gets, or if they're acute, gets antibiotics and herbs. I do have people who prefer natural only, and we've been very, very effective at doing that. Um, but I'll say in the chronic situation, that's where things are really different. You don't necessarily need antibiotics. And back when I started, it was like you need years and years and years of antibiotics and like three months of herbs to finish it. 
we've gotten so good with herbal formulations and single herbs through the research we just discussed that literally like I'm like, well, maybe at the end of say 18 months, I might need to give you two or four months of an antibiotic. Um, and realistically, and, and it, my practice is a blend, you know, we minimize antibiotics when we can, but they actually really do work. And, you know, I agree with you, Chris, a hundred percent, they have a time and a place and they should be used properly. Um, and I, I, it frustrated the example you use is the one that I use all the time. It's just like, you go to the acute care clinic for sniffles you had for five minutes and the doc, the path of least resistance is here's the, the antibiotic, right? Um, so in my mind, you use it in the acute setting in a chronic setting, it's an infectious disease. If you need it, use it. But I, I had this one young lady, her, um, her brother was about 10 when I started working with him and he had all kinds of psychiatric manifestations of tick-borne infections. He also had food allergies. Mom didn't think they're related, but because they were pre-existing, I treated him and he got better for all these things, these psychiatric stuff, but he also had his food allergies get better. So he, she said to me, well, my six-year-old daughter on her Alcat has like 45 foods you can't eat. And like 43 of those foods, we've proven out that she can't tolerate them. So it's not just some test. It was like, she really she freaks out. But if she doesn't have those 43 foods, she's fine. She's like, could it be Lyme? I'm like, well, Lyme is a tissue organism. It's been found in the gut wall, theoretically possible, but with no other symptoms of Lyme, us ordering a test is gonna potentially open Pandora's box. And she was aware and we went through the whole thing. We got the test very clearly had been exposed to Lyme at some point. And we said, well, let's do a simple trial. Let's do it a single antibiotic with a single probiotic. Six months later, we repeated the testing because all she started eating all these foods, eating all these foods. She's down the corn, dairy, and gluten that she couldn't eat and everything else is fine. I saw her, she had a tick bite at like a year ago. And so I just, you know, treated her for that. And she still is, you know, like 10 years later, good to go. So there are times where you can actually fix the gut with antibiotics, you know? But again, it's, I just think we do too much of it. Um, Oh, as a general rule, I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me of something that I would be, uh, I would be so remiss if I if we didn't talk about this, which is the tick induced meat allergy. Oh yeah, alpha gal, <laughs> right? That a lot of people I think still don't know about, haven't heard about, but there is a a red meat allergy that can develop from tick bites. So would you explain what what that is? What's happening? Yeah, I mean. And and thankfully, I don't see a lot of it here in the East because it's it's it you know they're nope. they're not a hundred percent. We're down in Texas and things, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it. I they my last I heard was it was pretty much coming from a Lone Star tick bite. They're not a hundred percent sure even what's triggering it, but yeah. And there's a blood test that can help. And I've actually seen um, a number of people from that neck of the woods uh, where they they start having the allergy, and we do the blood test, we find it, and then we actually through treatment are able to resolve that and they're able to eat it again. Can but you I, can you describe the the allergic symptom? Like the, what exactly? The thing is... I've primarily seen primarily seen is a rash. Okay. You know, it's just like some weird red rash. Um again, it's like there may be people that... watching right now that have had a persistent rash, right? And they're eating red meat regularly and you know, they're just what the heck is this rash? Right. And it's weird because it's like it's there. Supposedly there's like a sugar molecule that gets transmitted in the tick bite, this Lone Star tick bite and called alpha gal. And so then it's like then when you have beef and even pork or lamb, you can end up with a rash. And typically the things I've seen are, are rashes. You know, you can get hives or like the first person I ever saw had this big red. And this was like before it really came out. And he's from the East Coast. So we were for months. He just had this big red raised scaly thing that would somewhat peel mostly be red on the outside of his calf on the side of his leg and then you know it we just that came out and broke and then we figured out you know what it was so it is interesting i mean and people can get any kind of like allergy type thing you know so you get the the rash or the hives with the itching you know in rare cases, you can get swelling in the mouth and the lips, which is obviously the big bad one that you have to go to. Another place where medications are really good when you're dying of an allergic reaction, <laughs> we <Yes>. can prevent that. <laughs> you know, more reasonable things. Some people get wheezing or stomach pain. They'll get, you know, runny nose, headaches, stuff like that. Your normal allergy stuff, except it's doesn't make any sense. And it's like the day after you eat red meat, you know, it's like. 
Yeah. So this is, you know, file this away, folks. Some of you, you, this might sound eerily familiar to your situation right now or to someone that you know, right? That they've got some something weird going on and it could be this tick-induced meat allergy. And is it alpha galactin? Is that the yeah. is that the sugar molecule? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I you know read up on this years ago and it's it's right. barely have barely it's barely in there you know <laughs> well it, it's cool well i mean i it's it's in there enough that i can sort of know a little bit about it but it's like i don't see a lot of it where because i i mean i'm primarily in you know the tick that transmits lime isn't transmitting that i mean typically things like ehrlichiosis you know or um even q fever from coxiel burnetti are coming from you know the lone star tick and they're huge right the good news is they're big old ticks that most people see. And I've had, what's interesting is this year, I've had a bunch of people getting bit by them. And we've done exactly what you said at the top, Chris, is taking the ticks and sent them off, you know, and they're coming back negative. So a lot of the Lone Star ticks, at least in my neck of the woods, are not really heavily infected. That doesn't mean you can't get alpha gal from it, right? But, and we're kind of like trying to figure out. It's interesting though, because there, there's some cancer drugs. I think if you have alpha gal, you can have a worse, you can have some, uh, reactions to cancer drugs as well. Hmm. I think it's cetuximab or something like that. You can have an allergic reaction to if you also have alpha gal. So it's kind of like uh, nat natural stuff is better, right? And it's like if you think about all the ways you can, an allergic reaction is a nonsensical reaction of the of the of the immune system. So all the things that we were talking about that you can do on your own and all the natural healing things, the goal is to have you have an appropriate immune response that's not underactive, it's not overactive, it's just gets you right in that sweet spot. So no matter how sick you get, no matter how what you get exposed to, if you go into it in a really great place, you're going to be better off, you know, than you than you what you would have been otherwise. So I'm always like preventive care as much is 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 per, is personal responsibility care. Yeah, awesome. Well, Dr. Tom Warcroft, thank you for your time. I want to be respectful of it. And uh, anytime. Uh, so uh, this has been so informative. I'm so so glad we did this. I learned a lot. Where are you located, and and how can people find you? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Connecticut. We have a private practice called originsofhealth.com is the nice, easy way to get all the information. Do a little bit on social media, but, um, you know, we in the next little while have tommorecroft.com getting revised and coming out. So, but yeah, originsofhealth.com is a great place. Um, we've got, you know, Facebook and uh, YouTube under the same name. So if anybody has any questions, certainly reach out and always happy to help. That's fantastic. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Please like and share the video. Uh, share it with people you care about. Subscribe to my channel. If you're not an email newsletter subscriber, jump over to crispycancer.com and sign up for my email newsletter. I've got tons of awesome content to share with you to help you empower yourself, to change your life and your health. And, and that's what we're here for. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Tom Warcroft. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you on the next one.